Hello and welcome to Jetavana Rama Buddhist Monastery. Welcome back to a very interesting conversation on the workings of the mind. This is very important for us because we are now beginning to understand how we perceive, respond, react to things that happen in and around us. This is very important because, after all, this is what life is, isn't it? How we respond and react to the world around us. Because if we are not masters of this very subject, then we can get ourselves into all sorts of problems. I have said this in the past and I emphasize this again because I know that this is a problem that a lot of people have. And what might that be? Not being able to control how you respond to external stimuli. We must understand, of course, that the world that we live in is not in our control. I think that's pretty obvious. It is not only that you can't control the sun, moon and the stars, but you can't even control your neighbor, your closest friends, your family. You can't control the events that happen around you. Although sometimes you may feel like you are in control, you understand that you always live in fear. This we must accept. We cannot deny that even when you feel that you are in control of everything around you, that everything is going tick-tock according to your plan, your vision, and you are the orchestrator of the things that go on around you, I think anyone in their wise mind will understand and will acknowledge that there is a constant fear murmuring at the back of the mind. Always fearful that something might slip up. Something might just go wrong. Something might just go against plan. So that in itself steals our happiness. And regardless of how happy we try to make ourselves and keep ourselves as a function of the things that happen, events that take place in and around us, by that I mean the everyday occurrences, the everyday happenings, there's always a fear, there's always worry, there's always anxiousness, Tell me, someone works hard to prepare for an exam. They spend many hours, days, weeks, if not months, practicing, studying, burning the midnight oil and making sure that they, are, they have absorbed everything that they could possibly think of in preparation for the exam. On the day of the exam, if that were you, could you stop yourself from sweating anxiously, getting nervous, worrying, and sometimes even going into a fit? These things happen to people. Unfortunately, they don't understand why these things happen. So the best that they can do is again try and bring that response under their control as well. Assuming that this is all to do with the physical makeup of the body and attributing all that to chemical balances and imbalances in the physiology, one could resort to medication, some types of therapy, but if we can take a moment to understand why they happen the way they do, there in itself are answers laid bare 
pretty obvious. And once we understand those answers, we can free ourselves from the greatest shackle of all, and that is freedom from ourselves. To free ourselves from ourselves, we need to understand how we work, how the mind works, why we operate in the way we do, why we react to things that go on in the world in the ways we do. It's not just fear and anxiety. Even things like lust, would it not be better to control the right place, the right time, the right person, to have feelings like that for? You know, how many times do people get themselves into heaps of trouble because they have absolutely no control over their emotions? And then you end up doing things you didn't want to do. You didn't want to, but you did nonetheless. And then they say, the mind is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is not true, is it? It is not that the mind is willing, but the flesh is weak. In fact, the opposite is true. The flesh is willing, but the mind is weak. The mind is weak because the mind is ignorant. You know the expression, an ignorant fool. It is ignorance that makes one a fool. Cut that out. It is ignorance that makes one a fool. A wise man is someone who's knowledgeable, who's wise, who has wisdom, who understands. And that knowledge, that wisdom, that comprehension is what we are after. And I'm going to help you with that. With every step we take, I share with you some of the wisdom that my teachers have bestowed upon me. They have been infinitely compassionate and merciful. They have been ever so kind and generous. Because these truths, which I hold close to my heart, and I have spent time reflecting on, understanding, and then practicing, have revealed to me secrets about myself that no book in this world could reveal to me. No lesson in school or college or university could reveal to me. No time spent in the field working in any kind of career could have disclosed to me. These are the teachings of the Buddhas. And they're only passed down through the noble lineage, from one student to the other. This is why we must feel ever so fortunate to be in receipt of this teaching. One of the main reasons we transfer merits at the close of each of these talks. This is our way of saying grace, being grateful to all those who have helped us. So, today, we want to take another step forward on that journey, spend a little bit more time trying to understand our minds, the most important subject of all time. Understanding everything else will only understand, will only help us understand how the world operates, how the globe rotates around its axis and how the stars, the moon, the earth, the planets, bird and beast, flora and fauna, how they work. But these are all studies of the outside world. All these disciplines will only teach us how the world around us operates. But it will not do much, or they will not do much, to help us understand our responses to these events. So before we take that next step today, let us take a moment 
to pay homage to the perfectly enlightened one, the fully awakened one, the Supreme Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa So in the past couple of weeks, We took some time, consciously, to try and understand the inner workings of the mind. And I recall, and I'm sure you would as well, repeatedly emphasizing the fact that it is of little value to keep this study purely academic. There's so much you can study about the mind. Plenty of Buddhist books, scriptures, teachings out there. And we've only scratched the surface. Hardly that even. You could spend an entire lifetime understanding the workings of the mind. There's a separate book in itself, a separate, an entirely separate, I suppose you could say, field of study called the Abhidham, which some of you may have come across. And if you haven't, I'm not suggesting for one moment at this point that you should go and explore it, not yet anyway. But I'm just saying that this is available available for those who wish to master. But those texts and those teachings are quite academic. In those books you won't find the application of the Dhamma. It'll be like the chemistry lab. You'll understand what the chemicals are, their chemical composition, and how they react with each other. So it's a lab, but not of life. It's the chemistry lab. It's the lab of scientists. But what scientists must do is do those experiments, research, find out about the various characteristics of chemicals, their chemical, physical attributes, and then use that knowledge to devise things, substances, objects, equipment that can be used by the common man so that it makes life easier for them. It's what we do. Think of a bottle of bleach. You might use that to clean a surface, wash your Watch the floor of your bathroom. You don't need to understand the chemical composition of that liquid. You don't need to experiment how it works, what it reacts with, because you can simply read the label on the back of the bottle, can't you? But you can rest assured that before it got to you, lots of research, experimentation, reactions, have taken place in a laboratory somewhere far away, somewhere safely far away. But they do the hard work so we can make use of their labor. Make, we can make use of what they have gifted us, the scientists. And, on, and in much the same way, like we don't then take a bottle of bleach and go into a laboratory and start testing it, we simply use it. We use it in the lab of life. They invent it in the lab of chemistry or the lab of the scientist. So in much the same way, there's so much that Buddhist philosophy 
can teach us about the workings of the mind. You can do this until the cows come home and you will still have lots and lots and lots more you can find out and go deeper into this subject. This is why I make it very clear <coughs> Excuse me. This is why I'd like to make it very clear that these teachings we must only use as laymen, as lay people, to understand how it affects us in our day-to-day -day lives. You can let us worry about the research, the experimentation, and reap the rewards of that hard work. Well, that is our duty. That is what we are here for. That is our service to all of you. Free of charge, nothing expected in return. The only thing, I suppose, is that you make use of this and help yourselves by addressing the various issues that you might have in your life. So what are some of those issues? As we just talked a moment ago, fear, anxiousness, nervousness, jealousy, lust, desire, cravings that you might have, sorrow and grief, lamentation. How do you unpack these emotions? How do you face them better? Is there no option of getting rid of them? Because they're not comfortable, are they? These are not emotions that you enjoy. One might think that, well, what about lust, Bhante? Isn't that something that people go through, enjoying it as they do? Lust is a fire. As much as one might feel that it's an enjoyable experience, when the mind is lustful, you have no control over what happens next. It goes into a fit of seeking satisfaction. The Buddha says that there is no fire like the fire of lust because the more a fire spreads, the bigger it gets and the more damage that it makes along the way or the, the more damage that it does along the way. And so, although it might feel like it's a pleasurable experience, or even satisfying sensual desires, ask yourself on some occasions when you might have experienced this, have there not been times where you felt, I wish I could better control myself? What are these thoughts that I'm having? They're not even appropriate. How can I feel like this about so and so? This is not the right place for this. This is not the right time for this. Have you never felt really uncomfortable? Having such thoughts in the most inappropriate of places and times? And then, what have you done to control yourself? Most efforts would have failed. You can go for a walk, think about something else for a while, but all that are very temporary measures, aren't they? And not just temporary, they don't really fix the problem because they don't address it at its roots. So, therefore, you have to live your life suffering from the pangs of lust. It's like an ache that just doesn't go away, that never goes away. It keeps coming back. Have there never been times where you've been with, let's say, your best friend, or maybe the sibling of your best friend, 
or maybe the spouse of your best friend. I'm just saying, you know, these are situations that people find themselves in. And I empathize with them. Have you never been in those situations? Or maybe it's, an, it's a child, underage. Or maybe it's another adult. But you wish you had better control over yourself. Perhaps it's in a place where certain types of behavior is inappropriate. But you feel the fire burning inside of you. And now, who's suffering? Maybe you're in a public place. Maybe you're on a bus, in a train, on an airplane, and there's someone sat next to you. And the fire of lust is ignited because of something you saw, maybe something else you sensed. And now, you can't close your eyes and sleep. Now you feel that burning inside of you and it's really causing you aggravation, isn't it? It's making you restless. Gone is the cool. Gone is the calm. And then you think to yourself, why do I feel this way? Can I not stop myself? And that's also only if you feel if you have some sort of control. But sometimes you don't even know why you've reacted in some ways. You only come to your senses after the fact, after the event. The aftermath can be quite devastating. But now there's nothing you can do about it. Think about some of the reasons why people get sent to court or they're summoned to court and now they have to stand on the box and just confess. Now you just have to suffer. When you're convicted and you're punished, now you can't go back and make changes. Better judgment is only always after the fact. Now it's too little and too late. If only you could have been in better control of yourself. So that when you were in the heat of the moment, if you could have made some conscious decisions, if you could have been in better control of yourself, if you could have felt that you had another option, if you just had the power to get up and walk away. Only after you see the devastation that your lust has caused, do you feel this way? But then it's too late. But if you had that control in that moment, then you would have been left with no regrets. But today, how many people live in regret? How many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people live in regret? Buddhist philosophy is for everyone. It's not just for good people. It's also for bad people. Because we don't believe that there is such a thing called a good and a bad person. What we believe is that there are minds, some ignorant and some wise. These are the two flavors in which they come. A wise mind is capable of self-control. An unwise mind, an untrained mind, a foolish mind, in other words, an ignorant mind, ignorant about the truths, what truths, the truth that is Buddhist philosophy, the four noble truths, the truth of suffering, the truth about vexation, the truth about pleasure, what you know now about pleasure which you didn't perhaps some months ago. This stuff, the ignorant mind is incapable, it's incapacitated 
unable to control itself. So then, the reason that people resort to freeing themselves from vexation is from one perspective, not their fault after all. I'm not saying therefore that they should be vindicated and they, we should close down the prison system and all that. So, no, that's not what I'm saying. No, the prison should be there, law and order should be there, the police should be there, right? Crimes and convictions for those crimes. You know, the world will be the world the way it is, and it will forever be that way. But there is something that we can do to help innocent minds from falling victim to lust, from falling victim to anger and hatred and the actions that follow, from falling victim to ego, delusion, and the actions that follow, the words that follow. Because those words and actions can cause a great deal of harm and damage and misery to not just themselves but to others around them. There was a person by the name of Angulimala. Most of you may have heard of him. He was a young man who lived in the day of the Buddha. He was very studious and also very obedient, very respectful towards his teacher. But once, another student in his class who was jealous of his performance and also thinking to himself that his counterpart would go on to become his teacher's most favorite pupil. This guy was jealous about it. He spread a rumor and he even went up to his teacher and said some evil things about Anguliman. Unfortunately, the teacher, without questioning, without checking the facts, accepted the story. And after that, he tasked Angulimala to show his obedience to the teacher. What was the task? To make a necklace. Simple enough, you might think. But no, this necklace was not like any other necklace. This did not have flowers. It was not made of flowers. It was not to be made of flowers. It was to be made of fingers collected from human beings. A thousand of them. So what did Angilamala do? He was super obedient to his teacher. You couldn't say he was a wise man back then. He didn't know the right from wrong. All he wanted to do was to pay respects to his teacher, to be obedient to his teacher. And so he went on this task. He set forth on this task. Going round, home to home, and then into the thicket of the jungles. When people were really beginning to become scared of him, and they chased him away. But people were very scared of him. But in the end, he went into the jungles and stayed there. And whenever someone would come into the forest, maybe to collect some wood, or maybe to hunt, he would be the hunter. And every time he would find someone, he would see someone, he would kill them and collect their fingers. 
and using that, those fingers he would make a necklace. Now, the story has a much better ending than this gruesome crime or sin that you've just heard me relate. But later on, when the Buddha saw him and realized that he could be made a better man, the Buddha realized that this is not because Angulimala is a bad man. He realized this is simply ignorance in action. So he approached Angulimala and Angulimala of course was ready to complete his necklace with another finger. At the time he had seen his mother and he was chasing after her in the forest because the mother had come looking for him. The Buddha realized that he was about to commit a heinous sin. Went into the forest and he talked to him. There is more detail into how that particular scenario played out, but I'm going to leave that out for the, for the purpose of our discussion here. But in the end, Angulimala surrendered. He laid down his sword, his weapon, and he took refuge in the Buddha. Not out of blind faith or anything like that, but because the Buddha taught to him the philosophy, and he understood. He was wise enough to understand when taught, but not wise enough to understand on his own. So he was so fortunate to come across the greatest teacher he could ever find. What I'm trying to, what I'm hoping to demonstrate here is not the feat of Angulimala, but rather how the Buddha processed this series of events. You see, he didn't think to himself for one moment that Angulimala was a bad person, even after having killed many hundreds, if not thousands of people. The Buddha did not see Angulimala as a bad person, because he had, of course, understood the workings of the mind. And he realized that these are just mind moments, as we discussed in the last couple of weeks, that arise and pass away, but each one ignorant. Ignorant about lots of things. Ignorant about the truth. The truth that what you give is what you get. As much as Angulimala was wanted to repay the debt that he owed his teacher, or the promise that he had made to his teacher, he was blinded by this obedience. He didn't stop to think what damage he was causing himself, how much harm he was bringing upon himself by committing all those murders. And the Buddha realized that Anglimala was quite capable of becoming an arahant in that very birth. So he had plenty of wisdom, but he needed someone to show him mercy. And like the rays of sunlight helps to bloom a lotus flower, the Buddha realized that his words, words of wisdom, were required to help bloom this wisdom within Angulimala's mind. And that's exactly what he did all this time, not thinking to himself that Angulimala is a bad man. This is the moral of the story that I wanted to relate to you. So, we must then understand that there is no such thing as a bad man or a bad person, a bad woman or a bad child. What is bad is not the person. What is bad are the ideas that the mind holds. It's a bad idea not a bad person. It's a good idea, not a good person. 
It's the thought that counts. We've heard this expression. The thought that counts. Because it's, a, it's these thoughts which make or break. There are good thoughts and there are bad thoughts. And when these thoughts occur in the minds of individuals, you then begin to see those thoughts translated into action and words. Now, of course, you can't read a person's mind, so therefore you can't gauge if someone's words or actions are based in good or bad thought. At least not all of the time, perhaps some of the time, but not all of the time. And even then, when you can, you can't be absolutely certain. But what we can understand from this principle is that both words and actions are based in thoughts. And thoughts are a product of the knowledge that the mind holds. Because if the mind holds true knowledge, as we talked about last week, true knowledge is wisdom. If the mind is wise, if the mind has wisdom, then the thoughts which arise in that mind are wise thoughts. There will be thoughts of compassion, of loving kindness, of giving and generosity. There will be thoughts of mercy, thoughts of helping others. There will be thoughts of giving away. There'll be thoughts of peace and harmony. There'll be thoughts of relieving others of their pain and agony. These are thoughts that are based in wisdom. And on the other hand, if the mind is hijacked by ignorance, that is wrong knowledge, falsehood, knowledge that is incorrect, knowledge that is not the truth about the world, about the five aggregates, about suffering, about vexation, about pleasure, about happiness, and so on. If the mind holds incorrect knowledge, which is when we say that the mind is ignorant, when the mind is ignorant, then thoughts which arise based in ignorance, you will begin to see translate into, again, as it did before, actions and words. And now those actions and words will be deleterious, harmful, will be harbingers of pain and agony and grief. To all mankind. So then we begin to see people act in evil ways. Destruction follows. Devastation follows. War follows. Revenge follows. To think that it's a bad man who is behind all of this is not entirely accurate or precise. We need to take this situation and lay it on the surgical table, open it up, using the tools that we have, that is the Dhamma, and then we begin to understand when we know the workings of the mind, that all of this is based on the knowledge that the mind holds. And in the latter case, knowledge that this world is pleasurable. 
joyful, essenceful, that there is happiness to be had in sight, sounds, smells, taste, and touch, that pleasure is inbuilt into the experiences in life. Take a moment and think about why people commit atrocities, why people resort to killing, stealing. You wouldn't steal something that you thought was void of pleasure, would you? Would you? Think about it. You'd never do that. Anytime you found yourself stealing something, or you've heard someone stealing something, it has always been to acquire something that they feel is desirable. Whether that is an inanim inanimate object, or a person, or another living creature. I mean, you can steal all sorts of things, couldn't you? From a wristwatch on a man's wrist, to his wife, you could, and everything in between. His house, his children, his property, his country, even his life. So there's no extent to which there's no line you can draw and say these are all the things that one could steal. Theft is limitless. But all of that theft, all of theft is based on ignorance or based in ignorance. That you must understand. I'm helping you see the world in a new lens because then we begin to understand that it is not hate that we need to have towards this world and the people who live in it. Because hate has no place in Buddhist philosophy. Animosity has no place in Buddhist philosophy, even to the worst criminal. Someone may wish to take from you without your will everything, every single thing you own, maybe even parts of your body. But hate has no place in Buddhist philosophy, and neither does animosity. Neither does the will to retaliate or avenge someone who wishes to cause harm to you. Because through the lens of Buddhist philosophy, we see a very different reason to what other people do. We understand why people's actions and words are so. And that is because they are based in ignorance. So it is ignorance to blame, not them, is it? Because the same mind, if you were able to retrain the same mind, if you were able to inculcate with right knowledge and wisdom, you get a very different result. So it's not a bad person then, is it? Because a bad person is a bad person is a bad person. They never change. A good person is a good person is a good person and they never change either. But the truth of the matter is, today you see someone doing a bad thing and the following day you might see them doing a good thing and vice versa. So it's not that they are bad people or good people, but instead Thoughts and actions that you see them say or, sorry, that you see them do or you hear them say are based either in ignorance or in wisdom. And what is ignorance again? Ignorance is simply not knowing the truth. Therefore, is that fixed? Is that 
how it's forever going to be? If someone doesn't know something, can you never change that? Of course you can. All you got to do is tell them the truth. Show them the truth. That's all that requires for them to change. Because thoughts arise based on the knowledge that the mind holds true. This is what we talked about last week. If the mind holds the truth as its knowledge base, then thoughts which arise in that mind are good ones. If the knowledge that the mind holds is false, if it is untrue, then the thoughts which arise in that mind are bad ones, evil ones, harmful. And therefore the actions and words which follow will represent that. Now, if you see a bad person, how can you hate them? How can you hate a bad person? If someone were to if someone was to hate a bad person, the reason for that is because they themselves are ignorant. Ignorant of what? Ignorant of what I've just explained to you. Don't you think so? Just because you hear someone say something that is unpleasant, hear someone lie, or say some evil things, some bad things, just because you hear someone shout, scream, yell, hurt someone else's feelings, I mean intentionally, I don't mean by mistake, intentionally. For you to think that they are a bad person is again an assessment that is based in ignorance, you must agree. I'm not saying there's nothing bad about that. There is, but it's not the person that's bad. That's the point here. Ignorance is bad, I'll give you that. There's no doubt about that. In fact, so much so that the only thing I have an issue with is ignorance. I don't have a problem with anything else. I don't have a problem with people who might want to hit me, to beat me up, to shout at me, or even if they wanted to kill me. Not that I expect it to happen. I'm just saying, even if someone wanted to do that, it's important that I'm able to see that this is ignorance in action, not a bad person. It's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. It's a bad piece of knowledge. It's a rotten piece of knowledge. In other words, ignorance at play. So, now then tell me, is it reasonable for someone, let's take you, to help better understand and apply this in to your lives? If someone was to come and hit you, what would you do? Would you hit them back? Now you need to think about it, don't you? I'm not giving you the answer here. I'm only asking you to consider. I'm only prompting you to reevaluate your options here. As I said, I would do right at the beginning of this series of talks. I've always said I'm not here to make decisions on your behalf. I'm here to show you all the cards, lay them all on the table, so you can make your own decisions and your own choices. See, I believe that every human being should be free to choose. They, have, they should have the freedom of choice. And the biggest 
choice of all is the choice of freedom. Do you get that? I believe that every human being should have the freedom of choice. And the most important choice of all is the choice of freedom. What I'm about, what we're about, what we are trying to do here is to give you the freedom of choice. I don't want to manipulate you in any way because it gives me nothing in return. I'm not sat here expecting you to behave in a certain way because whatever actions you take are yours to then reap the consequences, be they good or bad, makes no effect or impact on me. But I'd like to empower you with the right knowledge so that you can make the right choices. But when someone is ignorant, they're not free to make the right choice. Therefore, they don't have the choice of freedom. You see, you can choose now to remain a lustful person. You can choose to be someone who gets angry a lot. You can choose now. You can choose to be someone who lives with hatred or anger towards your fellow human beings. You can choose to live with a grudge against someone in your family or maybe a friend or at least someone who used to be a friend. You can choose now. Perhaps up until now you did not have the choice because you could not control how you felt about them. When the fire of lust ignited within you, perhaps you were not able to control yourself. So therefore, although the flesh was willing, the mind was weak and therefore you just had to let go. You just had to let go. Because you did not have the choice of freedom. Therefore, you were not free to choose. You were not free to choose your actions. You were not free to choose your words. You were not free to choose your response. But today, I hope I have been able to at least begin to share with you the choice of freedom. This is a choice again. You don't have to be free if you don't want to. You don't have to listen to these talks if you don't want to. You don't have to care one tiny bit about what I say if you don't, have, if you, if you don't want to. There's a choice. But the point is, now you have that choice. Now you don't have to remain lustful and you don't have to be in those situations where you feel really uncomfortable because you don't want to behave in the way that you want to but you want to stop yourself and you can't do anything about it because that urge ignites inside and you know you feel like someone else is in control i just had to give in you might say I know what I was going to do was wrong, but I just couldn't control myself. I wanted to stop myself, but I couldn't. It was only after everything was said and done, I realized I shouldn't have done it. And then it was so embarrassing, let alone illegal. Now it's too late. Then you have to go running, hiding. then perhaps you have to end up behind bars. Your reputation completely tarnished and destroyed. And now you have to hide from other people. Now you're embarrassed to face them. You know what I'm talking about. I don't need to spell it out for you. I'm not saying that this has happened to everyone, but I'm saying, you know, these are some of the problems and challenges that people have in their lives. And I don't mind if you had the choice of freedom, 
and you still choose to act in that way. But I have a problem if you don't, if you don't have the choice. That's why my duty to you is to give you the choices to free yourself. I want to give you that choice. But now you have that choice. You can choose to become susceptible to lust. You can choose to become a victim of anger. Not the receiving party, but the party who exhorts anger. I want you to be able to choose between mercy and revenge. I want you to be able to choose between giving up and letting go. I want you to be able to choose between fighting back and being compassionate. I want to empower you with those choices. And there's only one way you can do that. There's only one way you can have the choice to be free of some of the addictions that you might have. Be that drug addiction, alcohol addiction, addiction to pornography, addiction to satisfying lustful desires. I want you to have the choice. Not be victim, not simply be prey to those carnal desires. I want you to be in control of your lives because that way you will live without regrets and you can die one day without regrets. So you see, this is the gift that we have for you. You are the result of your thoughts. Your thoughts are the results of what knowledge the mind holds. If the knowledge that the mind holds is true, then the thoughts that arise based on them or based in them are good ones. And therefore, words and actions as a result are good ones. If the knowledge that the mind holds is false and therefore the mind is ignorant, then the thoughts which arise based in them are going to be bad ones. And therefore, the words and actions that come out of that are going to be bad ones. Good thoughts, good words, good actions will bring you happiness. Bad thoughts, bad words and bad actions will bring you no end of pain. So this is why it's really, really important to understand these concepts, Buddhist philosophy, because herein you will find the answers to how the mind works. And that understanding itself is your transition from ignorance to wisdom. So that's what we're here for. And that's what we're all about. And that's what I have promised you. So hopefully that's what you come along every week to take from here. I'm going to leave you with that for today. Hopefully that has given you some food for thought and especially to help you reevaluate the ways in which you respond to situations that take place around you. I want to ask you this question and I'd like for you to give, some, give it some thought and you know, think about how you might respond in, a, in the future. If someone comes and shouts at you, Rightly or wrongly, 
Do you think it's reasonable to shout back at them? Who are you shouting back at? If it is ignorance that is at play here, and if it's ignorance that is the base for these words, then how, mo- how much of shouting is going to change ignorance to wisdom? Is that the right answer? Because the only way you can stop this from happening, the only way you can really find an answer to this problem is to replace the ignorance in that person's mind with wisdom. And is that to be done by shouting at them? Do you think that is a reasonable response? Or do you think that is as foolish as the action of the person who's shouting at you? What about if someone was to come and hit you? What do you think is the answer to that? Hit him back? How wise do you think that is? If that is also based in ignorance, and ignorance is something that happens in the mind, then what good is there is in hitting this person's body? Because ignorance is not in the body, which part of the body holds ignorance. So whacking them, hitting them, beating them down, and tearing them a new page, so to speak, is not going to help in any amount to fix this problem, because all of that is based in ignorance. Now, I'm not suggesting that you sit them down and start preaching to them, if they want, if they're in a you know, in a fit of rage, but that doesn't mean the right thing to do is to retaliate. Because when you retaliate to an observer like myself, sitting on the outside, knowing what I know today, I'm simply going to look at you and go, he hasn't got it, has he? God hasn't got what? The will to fight back? No. Patience? No. He just hasn't understood it. Hasn't understood what? The truth. So, someone who shouts back is as ignorant as the person who shouted in the first place. Do you want to be that person? In fact, which person do you want to be? The first ignorant person or the second ignorant person? This is what I want you to think about. Thinking about this, giving this some thought, giving this some consideration, ask yourself, how do you wish to respond in the future to events and to situations? That may or may not happen to you. Because you don't live in a world of saints, so you can expect that from time to time people will take out their anger on you Right? So, is it not better to be patient at that time and reflect on what you have learned today, apply them in the lab of life, because that is the lab of life, and then think to yourself, you know, this guy is like this, not because he's a bad person, but simply because it's a bad idea, and a bad idea is based on bad knowledge. So, hitting or fighting back or screaming back, yelling back, scolding them is no remedy for bad knowledge. The only remedy for bad knowledge is to replace it with good knowledge. It may be that you can't do it then and there because they're not ready to uh, listen to you. But that does not mean that the right answer in the circumstances, is to fight back or to scream back at them. Fair enough? Well, take some time and think about it. That's what I invite you to do. And we'll continue our conversation next week. All right then, before we conclude, let us now take a moment to transfer the merits that we have all acquired and bring the talk to a close. First and foremost, let us take a moment to transfer the merits we have all acquired by making offerings 
to the infinite virtues of the Noble Triple Gem, chanting Pirit and listening to the Dhamma, and engaging in various meritorious deeds today. Let us remind ourselves how incredibly fortunate we are to be in receipt of the Lord Buddha's teaching, and with immense gratitude let us transfer these merits to the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasikas, who since time immemorial have protected and preserved the sublime teachings of the Buddha, and passed it down through the generations of the noble lineage, in the form of the Sripitaka, which is thankfully available to us today to study, understand and comprehend the Dhamma. Let us also transfer the merits we have acquired to all members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all of the chapters who have dedicated their lives to the noble path and have committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us not forget that among them are the monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries who have always been by your side through thick and thin, come rain or shine. Let us also transfer these merits to our teachers and all other monks resident at this monastery, as well as all the Anagarikas and Anagarikas attached to the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits and express our gratitude to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by transliterating these sermons, sharing them out with others and inviting others to join them, and may to the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plane, redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plane. And may to the power of these merits, they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also transfer the merits we have acquired to our devotees, friends of the monastery, who for the sake of merits continue to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes everyone from those of you who have contributed to the construction of the monastery, to those of you who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes and medicines, as well as those who have passed on their know-how and continue to extend their well wishes. And may to the power of these merits they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer to our mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our elders, friends and acquaintances, employers and employees, and to all those who have helped us, supported us, assisted us in any way, shape or form. And by the power of these merits, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, Fulfill the Noble Eightfold Path and attain the Supreme Bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Let us also take a moment to run for these maids to the Devas, Brahmas, Spirits and Demons, primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who are committed to protect and fulfill this humble Sasana. Let us also transfer maids to our guardian deities who keep a watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way. And may to the power of these maids, they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the Noble Eightfold Path, and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also transfer merits to, to our ancestors who have predeceased us, to all who have been our friends, families, and acquaintances in, in this infinitely long journey in Sansara, and to those who have helped, supported, and assisted us in any way, shape, or form they could. Let us also transfer merits to the air members of the armed forces, as well as the police force, who have sacrificed their lives to protect the peace and harmony of our nations, and may all those who have lost their lives in the war be their friend or foe, rejoice in the merits that we have acquired today. There is also transformation to, to all those who have lost their lives in the natural calamities such as the tsunamis, earthquakes, landslides and pandemics, including the most recent and prevailing one, reminding ourselves that among them will be those who have been friends and family to us in this long journey in Sansara. Let us take a moment to transfer merits to them and may to the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plane, redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plane. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us all resolve that may, through the power and blessings of all the maids we have acquired throughout the day, we be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of arahants on this blessed land. And finally, may through the power of all, and finally, may through the power of all the maids we have acquired throughout the day, you and I, and everyone who's helped make this program a success, become an arahatun mahanse, an arahat teranin mahanse, in this very life itself and in the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And on that note, we shall conclude today's talk. We look forward to talking to you next week. May the blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all.